Excellent. I hope you enjoyed that. Got you warmed up, fueled up, ready to rock and roll this day. Uh, very excited to be a part of this with you. And my the first person I get to introduce today is my good friend, Lance Miller. And I've got an official intro that he's given me that I'm going to share in a minute. But I have to tell you, you know, Lance is um, he's an incredible person um, because I've seen him seen him do so much. He's not only the world champion of public speaking from 2005, uh, but he gives back so much to Toastmasters. Um, and he's so much fun to be around. He actually stayed at my house. Uh, it, it was uh, really cool. You have a world champion stay at your house. And he's also coached me more than once when I've been competing. And he beats me up quite often when we're doing that. But it's all part of the growing process. And that's what we're here to, to do. So I'm so excited to have Lance here to speak to us today on leadership. So here we go. Here's his official intro. Lance Miller is an award-winning speaker and trainer. He has delivered over 5,000 speeches in over 60 countries, and he is Toastmasters 2005 world champion of public speaking. He was instrumental in building his home club, Renaissance Speakers, to 95 members and number four uh, Toastmasters club in the world, and he has worked with over 80 districts around the world, helping Toastmasters win with Toastmasters. He is the founder of Online Summit Central, where he hosts the World Champion Speakers Summit, where he shares the path and experience from 30 world champions of public speaking. And outside of Toastmasters, Lance is a partner in Miller, Knutson, and I hope I get this right, DeRay LLC, an executive management firm specializing in business performance and growth. He has extensive business experience, having completed five new business startups and six corporate turnarounds. He also has an impressive life of, of adventures, including climbing mountains. Hey, what, what, what are we doing today? Sailing across oceans, flying airplanes, rafting wild rivers, and scuba diving around the world. With his talk, Toastmasters, an internship for success, please join me in a warm virtual welcome, Mr. Lance Miller. Well, thank you, Russ. I want to let you know I still have my Stampede hat from, from Calgary. It's great to be back in um, District 42. I've been up to see you guys a lot of times. And, you know, I, I'm a little concerned because, Russ, I stayed at your house twice. And you, you only said I stayed there once. Maybe, I don't know, maybe something occurred. Whoever's in control of the Zoom, if you could uh, please allow me to share the screen. I'm going to want to throw a uh, PowerPoint on here at some point. So... You can make me a co-host. I would appreciate that. And today, I I want to just share with you a little different perspective that I have on Toastmasters and what Toastmasters really did for me. And I'm going to dive into a couple of different areas of my life on really what I'm. I've, the essence of this message is two points. One is that. That was a good pause, wasn't it? A good pregnant, pregnant pause. Uh, the, the fact of being in Toastmasters is not about being a great Toastmaster. That's not the goal of Toastmasters, is to be a great Toastmaster. And that is not how I went about Toastmasters. The whole reason I was in Toastmasters was to be better at life, at achieving the things I wanted in life. And I needed a place where I could develop the skills. The second thing is, is that if I wanted to be successful in life, I would first try to do it in Toastmasters because it's a lot easier to be successful in Toastmasters than it is in life. You know, I've never been fired from Toastmasters. <laughs> I can't say that for life. Okay, so the, the experience we have, I, I see a lot of people will get sort of hung up on a lot of the either the rules, the regulations, the manuals, or the personalities, or something like that, and, and not realizing that that's all part of the learning experience that we have to go through. Now, as area directors, you're stepping up to a different area of responsibility and a completely different challenge in working within the Toastmasters environment. I want to roll back a little bit. We're, we're talking, in my life, we're talking about achieving the summit um, with the training today. When I was 14, I talked my parents into sending me from my small 
rural town in Indiana that I grew up in, to Colorado, to a mountaineering and leadership school called the Telluride Mountaineering Leadership School for the summer. And I spent that summer in Colorado at 10,000 feet or above, hiking mountains, learning how to technically climb, rock climb, rappel, rest myself sliding down snow fields, river rafting, and then the final, you know, sort of the final aspect of the program was to do a 10-day hike through the Rockies with six of us where we had to navigate everything ourselves and carry all of our own food and take care of ourselves and figure out all the problems we had, how to solve them. When I got back home, I was looking at it and I was looking at, I got this little pin that said, tell your I'd mountaineering and leadership. And I said, I didn't really learn any leadership there. I learned mountaineering school skills. I didn't realize the leadership I'd learned until I came back home to my classmates and my peers in my little town in Indiana. And I realized that my thinking was different because I had been placed in so many challenging environments and so many challenging situations that summer that no longer did I have the same self-imposed boundaries on what I could do, the self-imposed limitations that I'd put there. I had an improved confidence in being able to figure things out and being able to overcome different types of adversity or when things didn't go right. And of course, like Calgary, I grew up in an area that had a lot of snow and, and bad weather and things. And so, you know, we'd get eight, 10 inches of snow and you'd wind up with a car in the ditch and everybody'd freak out. And I go, come on, no, let's go, let's push it out. We can get it out and we get out and get everybody pushing and get it out of the ditch. And, and there was an attitude I had that was different than my peers. My family had a milk and ice cream business. I started working and that was about 10 years old, worked all through the plant, started dipping ice cream for in our plant in our little dairy store for when I was about 11. But when I was 16, I started running milk routes. And my 17th year, I ran vacation routes all for the whole summer. So I had to learn the guy's route and then run it for two weeks while he was on vacation. And I can remember feeling way overwhelmed. And I, you know, this is beyond me. I'm only 17 years old, but I learned how to run those routes. And I ran milk routes for 10 years. And I look back on my life and there was so much I learned about being effective about being focused, about how to handle people, about you know keeping my inventory straight, about accounting, running milk routes. And I don't run milk routes today, but I have all the benefit of having effectively and efficiently run milk routes and know how fast you have to move and how you have to rotate your stock and how you have to have, pull the truck up and how you have to pull the, the cases off, off the truck without throwing your back out how you have to deal with an independent grocer who's usually tougher than nails and he thinks you're way too young to be in there and he's, he's criticizing every single move you make and how to handle those personalities. I gain that insight by running milk routes. Now, I'm not a milkman today, but I have the experience that I carry forward in life. And the, the last thing right now I wanted to share with you and Russ, Russ mentioned this, when I was 19, I got my pilot's license. And getting my pilot's license, I, and I flew pretty extensively for about 10 years. When I moved to California, the cost of living was so high out here and the airspace was so nuts, I stopped flying. But I, I have a great love of flying and I, I have hundreds of hours in the cockpit and I was always very safe. I never got into any, we'll say, life-threatening situations because I was trained and I took full responsibility for my flying. But what I learned to do by becoming a pilot was how to plan things out, how to predict what was going to happen, understanding all the components that I had to deal with because it was a life and death situation that I was, I was taking myself up into. If I didn't handle it right, there's a good chance I wouldn't come back. And the fact that I became a pilot has served me so well for the rest of my life because I have the confidence that I can learn complex systems. I didn't my computer. Everyone's frozen. It's Lance that's from. I think I think running milk routes like flying airplanes. 
And as I moved forward in life, I realized how much those experiences played into my day-to-day -day living on my thinking and my actions that uh, I was using in business and with friends and, and just in, in, in living. And I, I want to go into my Toastmasters experience because quite honestly, like I said, I didn't join Toastmasters to be a great Toastmaster. I was very frustrated in my life at the time I joined Toastmasters. I had moved to California. I'd been in a family business and worked there, I said, for 16 years. I worked there four years out of college. And the nepotistic aspects of that business were very brutal. And it, the family part of it, it, we'll just say it was rule, it was management by opinion. <laughs> and the opinion that I was sort of young and full of myself and then they'd be put in my place a lot. And there was probably some truth to that. But at the same token, I had a lot of experience and I was really hungry to run an organization. I was really hungry to, to actually make an impact in the world. And, and I wanted to play that game. And, and I moved to California and I had some good jobs, but I was never in that position. I was I worked for the Olympic Committee in 84, which was phenomenal. I worked for Nestle. I worked for Anheuser-Busch. There were some great, some great jobs, but I wasn't in a position that I could really impact any organizations. So when I joined Toastmasters, I was very frustrated because I wanted to run an organization and I love speaking, I love leading, and I wasn't getting the opportunities to do that in my life. So I step into this Toastmasters club and I joined primarily because there was an audience to listen to me. <laughs> Honest truth. I didn't realize what I had to learn in, in the Toastmasters program. But about six months, a lot of you have heard this story, about six months after I joined the club, we had 35 members in the club. We had about 12 members coming to the meeting. And I kept wanting to become, become president. I was really excited to become president of the club, but there were other people in line and stuff. But we, we had five of us that met one day. That's all that showed up for the meeting. And this might remind you of some of your clubs that you're dealing with right now. And we were sitting around trying to figure out if we should close the club or keep the club. And one of the guys said, you know, if we're going to do this, let's win with Toastmasters. And that had such an impact on me because I was going, yeah, let's actually win with this thing. You know, and somebody else said, you know, they run this program this was back in the 90s and we had a, what I thought was an excellent DCP program where they gave you points for everything that you accomplished and they ranked all the clubs internationally. And we were like 6,000 in the world at this time. And he says, let's be a top 10 club. And we all looked around and said, that sounds cool. And we had no idea what it was gonna to take to be a top 10 club in the world, but that was a goal we were going for. And it took us five years to turn that club around and take it from 12, members attending. We got the 35 reactivated and then we built it to 95 members. And in 1999, the last year of that Distinguished Club program, we were the number four club in the world in Toastmasters. And that experience of building that club taught me how to work with people. It taught me how to inspire people instead of oppress people by managing. And the, the whole component of leadership is to raise people up to achieve more than they realize they could to bring the best out in those people. And if you've heard my world champion speech, which is on the really on the power of validating rightnesses, that is not just a speech. That is something I learned in Toastmasters and it's something I experienced the opposite of a lot of out of Toastmasters because I was managed basically by invalidation. And when I got into Toastmasters, we, we put a policy in my club that discipline is very light and we have to maintain a fun, friendly environment. So whatever happened, it had to be fun and friendly and you couldn't strangle anybody in the club, even though I wanted to several times. <laughs> but <laughs> what I wanted to do was what, what we were doing was, was, was we had a goal and we were working to achieve that goal. And I just want to let you know, I, I've seen something in Toastmasters that a lot of people haven't seen. And when I do these live seminars, I'll go, when, who, who's been vice president of education? And almost all the hands go up. I said, what happens in May when you're vice president of education? And usually, I mean, it doesn't take any time at all. Everybody goes, you're begging people to complete a speaking level so you can get your DC P points in. I said, that's right. You're begging people. And they usually have a nasal tone and they go, you know, I don't really want to do it right now. I want to do it when I want to do it. And I want to be pressured into it. I have a tendency to just want to take those people out in the street and shoot them. Okay. <laughs> so 
here's what happened in my club. May would come around. And this is like 97, 98, 99, when we're like, we are this juggernaut of this club. The members would be calling the vice president of education and they'd be saying, you haven't given me enough speaking slots to finish my CC. I'm not going to be responsible for this club not being a top 10 club. You find me speaking slots. <laughs> and the D vice president of education is going, God, everybody's yelling at me. We went to second meetings the second half of the year to fulfill all the educational requirements of all the people we had. And, um, but what the incredible part was, it wasn't me, it wasn't the five of us that met for coffee. It was the entire club that wanted to achieve that goal. And that's the only way we we're able to achieve the goal. And one of my talks I do now extensively is that leadership involves everybody. And what's happened so often in leadership is that leadership, I actually, I'll, I'll back up just a second. I, as I say, I read a great book on leadership one time. It's called The Dictionary. <laughs> and I looked up the word lead and I go down, one of the things I do is I go down to the derivation. Where'd this word come from? Because you have to realize that in the, the evolution of mankind, there was a time in history that the word lead did not exist. There were a bunch of people sitting around a campfire and they were grunting and somebody says we should come up with a certain grunt that means what you're trying to say there and so we came up with the word lead and the word lead comes from a, a latin word that means to go so the first thing to understand about leadership is it's, you got to go someplace <laughs> and so the first thing to know in leadership is where are you going and the second thing is getting your people to arrive there. That's really what leadership's about. It's knowing where you're going and getting everybody to arrive there. And that's the end of the, That's all you need to know about leadership. Where are you going and you get everybody to arrive there. Now, there's a lot of things that fill in in between. But what's happened with a lot of leadership, and we hear this in Toastmasters a lot about servant leadership. The only reason we have a term servant leadership, that's the only type of leadership there is, is because we are so used to oppressive leadership where I am the leader, therefore I will oppress you and you will do what I say is what winds up coming out of a lot of um, a leadership. The, the leader, there's no goal. The leader is there to control the group and get them to do what the leader says they want them to do. And for a lot of business situations I've been in, this has been prevalent. It's like they want me to run harder, work harder, I'm on the treadmill like the hamster and work harder, get paid the same amount of money, but I'm here to get more work out of you. And, and it's like there's a suppression that I need to push you down to get you to work harder. Great leadership lifts people up. They inspire people. And looking at your roles as area directors and getting your clubs motivated, and even if you're, even if you're a club officer, looking at your roles with your members the whole program that built my club and that I learned in Toastmasters was how to lift people up to be better than they thought they could be, how to inspire them to achieve what they want. The only thing I have to work with with an individual is their interest and their willingness to do the job. As I say, we're here to inspire the person. Now, inspire means to breathe life into as opposed to expire. <laughs> and you, you may have had some leaders that expire you, they suck the life out of you and you come out going, I don't know what's going on. I have certainly experienced plenty of that. Toastmasters taught me how to lead people through inspiration and through true motivation, addressing their interest and their willingness to achieve what the group needed to have achieved. And what that required was a lot of communication. And one of my leadership principles is the amount of communication to run any organization is normally grossly underestimated. And I'm talking, they, people put 5% of the amount of communication that they need to in an organization. And when I was running my club and when I run businesses, I have a lot of time I'm talking to people and it's not talking at them. It's actually sitting down and listening and really understanding them and acknowledging what they say, even if I disagree with it. I don't have, I can acknowledge what they say without agreeing with what they say, but I want them to know that I heard them. I got them. Okay, now let's talk about that point. Okay? And building their agreement 
to achieve what we need to achieve. And Toastmasters gave me the environment that I could go into and I could make my mistakes and I could screw things up and I didn't get fired. And what happens was just like when I was climbing mountains at Telluride Mountaineering School or running milk routes in Indiana or flying my airplanes, I developed skills that I carried out of Toastmasters and I took back in the workplace and my entire career trajectory changed. I started getting management jobs. I started being very effective at running groups. I had people loving to come to work, which is one of the things that I feel work should be the best part of our week. We should, shouldn't be the worst. We can't, we can't wait to get home for the weekend because I hate working. I think working should be one of the, the best parts of our week that we love what we're doing. And um, we, we come in and I learned that by, again, by running Toastmasters clubs. Uh, going over just a couple points on some of the stuff that were critical to my club that I've taken into the business world. But when we had five, we, we had that meeting with five people. We had 12 people coming to the meeting. We decided to be a top 10 club back in 1993. We split up the list of the 35 people in the club and we called them. Now that alone is something a lot of Toastmasters don't do. They don't call people that don't come to the meeting, but we called them and we asked them a couple questions on why they liked coming to the meeting. <clears throat> we didn't say, you're not coming to the meeting anymore. Why aren't you coming to the meeting? We said, what did you like about coming to the meeting? They gave us three fundamental answers. The first reason that they liked coming to the meeting is they wanted to have fun. The second reason they wanted to come to the meeting is they liked seeing their friends. And the third reason that they liked coming to their meeting is they wanted the personal improvement they got through Toastmasters. But above the improvement was fun and friendly. And we realized immediately why our club was failing. We had two presidents in a row who were not fun and friendly. One president was sort of draconian in his actions, and he was using that authoritative leadership role about he's going to tell us what to do. And every meeting started off that we're all going to hell in a handbasket unless we're doing what we're doing. Nobody's making the grade. He changed all the rules. We hadn't read the book. We hadn't read the manual, so we didn't know that he was changing the Toastmaster manual. So he made speech speech evaluation pass fail. You nobody's going to be a competent communicator in this club unless you're competent. And so you, people had to do their icebreaker two or three times until they got it right. We had people quit after the icebreaker because you flunked them on the icebreaker, and that's not part of Toastmasters. He gave us fines if you were late to the meeting. And once he gaveled down at the start of the meeting, you could walk in two seconds later, and he would call you out. He goes. That's a fine. You're late. You know, so you felt like crap walking in the meeting. And and then the next president was just this milk toast of a guy who didn't know what to say. Would start the meetings off with, well, what, what 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 can one say about today?" And it wasn't a rhetorical question. He was standing up in front of the room, wondering what to say. And we're like, it was like watching paint dry, trying to get the meeting started. So we realized it had to keep it fun and it had to keep it friendly. And the other thing was part of fun and friendly or, or fun, and I want to emphasize this, it's not funny. Fun is high morale. Fun is enjoyable. And what's enjoyable is achieving the purpose of the organization, the purpose of the meeting, achieving that purpose. And so our meetings run on time and they run very rapidly. We don't have people stand up and take five minutes to ask a table topics question you know, or ask a table topics question, the person answers it, and then the table topics master takes three minutes to give the answer that they thought would have been a good answer to the table topics question, things like that that you see going on in meetings all the time. And working with your clubs, there's some key things that I, that I really look at. And I, I went over this earlier, I think it was early this week or last week, I can't remember, I do so many of these things. I, I did a program with your club coaches up there in District 42. But I, I'm going to I'm going to cover three reasons that I found clubs fail. And by studying why clubs fail, we can figure out what it's going to take to make them, to make them uh, work. But um, one of the critical things that we found out about our club was when we started and ended the meeting on time, the membership stayed high. As soon as we started the meeting late and stopped late, we, our, our attendance started to drop off. And we statisize everything in the club. We statisize how many new guests we have each week. We statisize how, how many speeches get done. We statisize how many members attend the meeting each week. So we can look at our trends and see what's going on. That's another thing I recommend. We just do it on an Excel spreadsheet and we print the graphs out and we can say, okay, look, we're getting an average of, you know, 
26 people per meeting right now. We had an uptrend, but it's been downtrending for three weeks. We need to get that back up. We need to find out what's going on. So we were watching numbers, which is another point in management we have to do all the time. But uh, I hate it when that happens. I had a great point I wanted to make to you. And I started talking about statisizing stuff. Oh, starting and stopping meetings on time. And so what we watched is when I became president the first time, we were starting our meeting this almost 15 minutes late. And that had creeped over four or five years where we started them three or four minutes late. And then people got used to coming three or four minutes late. So we started them five or six minutes late. And it just kept growing. And then the meeting was getting out 20 minutes late. And so I said, we're going to start the meeting and just, we just, you know, we have a weekend club, we have a three hour meeting, nine to 12. And I said, we're going to start at nine o'clock, be here at nine, be here at five to nine. The meeting will start at nine o'clock. And for the, it, the club, it was amazing. It only took them three months to start coming to the meeting on time. <laughs> and I started that meeting with four people in the meeting so many times. I'm up there gavel down at nine o'clock and then everybody's walking in and the meeting has started and they're late. And that's actually what changed everybody because they kept coming and they realized they were late. It, but it took three months for the entire club to start coming to the meeting on time. But for the last 23 years, we start our meeting on time and we end our meeting on time because people have obligations elsewhere to go. So as, as area directors, one of the things I would have you work with and inspire the willingness and interest in the members of the clubs that your area directors over is to make sure they start on time and they end on time. And more importantly, in between that they run the meeting on time. They have a schedule on how much time is for the business meeting, how much time is for table topics, when does the first speaker start, second speaker start, third speaker start, when does the evaluation start, when does the meeting end, and you, that should be timed out in the meeting, and then they run that meeting on time so that they make sure they stay on schedule. Okay. <clears throat> now, there's, there's a couple points I want to go over that there's four areas of development that I've experienced in Toastmasters that's helped me so much outside of my life. And Toastmasters, we have the, the mantra where leaders are made, okay? But most people join Toastmasters because they want to get over their fear of public speaking. They wanna improve their speaking, okay? I won't get into the politics of where leaders are made. That's a whole other talk. <laughs> um, you have the area of public speaking, that area of personal development in Toastmasters. And there's two components to that. There's the prepared speeches, but there's also table topics. And table topics, I've gotten more, as much out of table topics as I have out of prepared speaking because it taught me to how to think on my feet. It, it taught me to assess my values, assess my philosophies of life. So when I got asked a question, I was prepared to answer it. It gave me the ability to think when I got something thrown at me. And probably one of the biggest wins I had from table topics was getting stopped by a policeman one time and I was able to have a conversation with him <laughs> and I wasn't I was I was sitting there talking to him I go what are you doing in this part of the neighborhood there you shouldn't have it you shouldn't stop people in this part of the neighborhood we had this great talk tried to get off you know he goes ah you get stopped by a motorcycle cop you're getting a ticket so I got a ticket anyway it's a long story but I I was calm I was calm talking to the policeman I went wow what a win from table topics but there have been so many situations in my business life where I get called into a meeting and sitting there and there's six people in the room and they start asking me these questions and I'm handling it just like a table topics question. And they go, these people that are in Toastmasters, oh, <laughs> every question was an opportunity to make a little speech. And they just going, oh, look at this. He just takes everything and handles it. That, that has helped me so much. So we had 25% of the gain in Toastmasters is learning to speak. The other 25% is the coaching, and we don't call it evaluation in my club, we call it speech coaching, because I can evaluate you. And I can tell you that you're fat and your shirt doesn't match. And I haven't done anything to help you. The whole point in our club is we want to coach you to be better. So we have speech coaching. And I would just say this in the professional world, nobody hires a speech evaluator. Everybody hires speaking speech coaches is what they hire. So we coach in my club and learning how to be an effective coach, to work with an individual, to give them effective feedback, to make them more competent as an individual to, and we talk, I talked about this, to increase their willingness, to increase their interest in doing what they're going to do 
is something I learned how to do in Toastmasters. And that pays huge dividends outside of Toastmasters because I go into organizations now and have to get the team to work, have to increase the productivity, have to get everybody on the same page. And you don't do that by firing everybody. You do that by taking the existing resources, increasing the interest, increasing the willingness to do it. Okay. The third area of development is effective meeting management. And running your Toastmasters meeting, running that one meeting as Toastmaster or as general evaluator or even as table topics master for the little section you get, you learn how to run a meeting. You learn how to start it on time, keep it on time, and end it on time. You learn how to make sure that the everything is set up for that meeting properly. And in my business life, when I have meetings, the conference room set up, there's an agenda laid out. I usually have water bottles already laid out. The chairs are all straight around the table and I'm at the door greeting everybody when they come in. And I've been to so many meetings that you show up in a conference room and there's papers all over the place and the place is a mess and you try to clean it up. And then the person with the meeting comes in right at the last minute to sit down with their stuff and they're all huffing and puffing and trying to, trying to get the meeting going. I have people, and then the other thing is my meetings end on time or early and I have people going, I love coming to your meetings. And that's one of the most effective things that's helped me out of Toastmasters is how to run an effective meeting. The fourth area is the leadership skills of being an officer in the club and making the club run for six months or a year. And the seven officer positions we have represent the seven main positions in any organization from your vice president of sales, which is VP of membership, to your vice president of promotion and marketing, which is your VP of public relations, to your, um, like your, chief operating officer, which is your vice president of education, your treasurer, president, you know, CEO, all those things, you get to run your own organization and learn how to work as a team for a year to keep everything on track. And that's why I, I talk about Toastmasters as an internship. You get to come in here and make your mistakes. Okay. So as again, as district directors, it's up to you to convey these things to your clubs that this is not about being a great Toastmaster. This is about you developing your skills to be more successful in life, to handle life better. And if you can't run a Toastmasters club, you're not gonna run a business properly. You know, but again, I'm gonna come back. The whole way you do that is addressing the interest and the willingness of the individual through inspiration to raise them up so that they realize they can't achieve their goals. Most people, Specifically, I've seen this in Toastmasters. I'm, I'm in Rotary. I'm in a lot of other organizations. Toastmasters is really a development program. So we have people coming into it that are wanting to develop their skills. And that means they feel they lack the skills they need. And with that comes a lot, many times, a lot of lack of self-esteem, a lack of self-confidence to achieve the things they want. And so we have to realize what we're dealing with in this program. And the whole thing is to just get the guy to do it. Okay, I talked about three reasons that clubs fail. Let me go over those with you right now. And when I sat down and looked at my club and I saw why my club, just so you know, we have been presidents distinguished with all 10 points. And just in December this year, we were presidents distinguished with all 10 points. Uh, for the last, was this the 20, the last 24 years or something like that. To, to, to me, this, if anybody heard me talk, you heard me talk about the current DCP program. You know, my grandmother said you could say anything about anybody as long as you end it with God bless them. Okay, <laughs> so that's the ugliest man I ever saw in my life. God bless him. It just makes everything all right. So Toastmasters International came up with this new distinguished club program. God bless them. Uh, you can have 20 members in a failing club with this program and be presidents distinguished and still have a failing club. It's the craziest thing I've ever seen. But here's the other side of it. There's no reason. I'm sorry, I think I said no reason, right? Yeah, no reason that every club in Toastmasters is not presence distinguished because it's actually a really low goal to hit. And I mean, if you've got eight people in your club, uh, you've got, now I know it's shifted a little bit with pathways, but still the number of education completions you, you need to get, the number of new members you need to get to get your officers trained. It's just the basic stuff you got to do to run your club to be president's distinguished. But let's look at why clubs fail. The first reason I saw that clubs failed and what happened in my club and why it was failing was because nobody owned the club. 
And what I meant that by that was nobody owned the success of the club. When I joined Toastmasters, I came in wanting to improve my speaking skills. And I said, I had an audience to listen to, but I, I wanted to learn. And there were people already in the club. So I assumed that they were ahead of me. So if there was a problem, it was their problem to solve. I didn't come to the club to solve the club problems. I came to learn from the people that were already here. And this is something I call an SEP, which is somebody else's problem, which if you've ever read Douglas Adams' Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, he talks about this as a mental component that humans have. They look at something and can't see it because they go, that's somebody else's problem. What turned my club around is there were five of us that started owning the club. What keeps a business going is there's a business owner. And eventually, if there's a problem in the business, it hits the business owner's desk and the problem gets solved. And if you have good management, it gets solved at the management level. If you have good workers, it gets solved at the workers level. But what happens in a lot of Toastmasters Club, because everybody looks around and says, somebody should do something about this. Nobody owns the club. The problems have a tendency to persist. And with that, owning the club, we usually are in Toastmasters one or two hours a week. And we have a tendency to get caught in this time continuum where we just go, we'll solve it next week. We'll solve it next week. We'll solve it next week. And it never gets solved. And that comes back down to an ownership issue. Okay. So when we took responsibility for my club and started owning the club, the club started, we started solving the problems of it right there. And we weren't looking for someone else to solve the problems. The second reason that clubs fail is that nobody does the program. And the program right now is the Pathways program. That's a whole other talk topic. We can talk about that for two or three hours, but by, you know, here's the simplicity. It's the program we got. It's the program we do. I'm working on my third level five right now. Okay. But what I saw with a lot of Toastmasters clubs that people were taking two, three, four years to move through their CC manual in the old legacy program. What turned my club around is we got everybody to do the program. And we wanted to be a top 10 club and we got so many points for every CC, for every AC we got. So we went to the members and we started targeting them out to finish their CC this year, to finish their AC this year so we could come up on the rankings. And what turned the club around is we got people doing the program and speaking frequently. Okay. And when they started doing the program and speaking frequently, they started keeping the gain they got from each speech. Now I talk about Toastmasters, you know, sort of like an exercise program and if you haven't exercised in five years and you go to the gym and you work out, you come home the next day, you're sore. And if you said, I'm so sore, I'm not going back to the gym for six months. The next time you go to the gym, you're going to be sore again because you lost all the gain from that one day that you got. Anybody that's been to the gym knows you're going to have to go three days a week for probably three weeks before you're going to get through your soreness. And then you're going to start building some muscles. Well, the same thing's true with speaking. And I consider speaking to be like a muscle. You get up and speak and you're super nervous. And I see people go, I was so nervous. I'm not going to speak for six months. Well, when you got people, we got people speaking every three to five weeks, they started keeping the gain from every speech they got and their life started to improve. And they started to get the twinkle in the eye and the spring of the step. And they started to get enthusiastic about Toastmasters because they were becoming more competent. They were becoming more confident as individuals. We got them to do the program. The program works if we do it. And I'll, I'll use another analogy on this. I had a friend of mine that, you know, five or six years ago, I wanted to lose 50 pounds and he joined Weight Watchers. And I saw him like six months later and I, I said, how's it going? He goes, that, that didn't work. I said, okay. So I saw him like three months ago and he'd lost the 50 pounds. And I said, what'd you do? He goes, I joined Weight Watchers. So I thought that didn't work. He goes, no, this time I did the program. <laughs> Before what he did, he went to the meetings and got weighed in and he sat there, but he kept eating like he always ate. He didn't exercise. He didn't do anything. And the same thing's true with Toastmasters. You go to Toastmasters and sit in a meeting and don't do the program. You're not going to get the gain from the program. And then after a while, people go, um, you know, it's fun. I enjoy the meeting, but I'm not getting that much out of it. No, they're not getting, they're not putting anything into it. How can they get anything out of it? So as district directors get, or excuse me, as area directors get your clubs to target their members out to move through their pathways program and speak frequently and have that progression going and they'll start to get the benefit of the program because they're doing it and that is what changes lives and that's really what we're in the business of is sort of reviving the dead <laughs> i talk a lot about toastmasters a lot like church okay 
we, we save souls and we revive the dead here. And you know exactly what I'm talking about because there are people that come into Toastmasters that are pretty close to death and they can't even talk. And you, six months later, you can't shut them up and you realize how alive they are. Right? <laughs> so um, get them to do the program. The third reason clubs fail is they don't promote. Now, I'm not saying they promote ineffectively. I'm saying they don't promote. They sit there and go, we don't know how to get new members. You know, the Toastmaster skills are something everybody needs. I mean, we're on planet Earth with human beings. There is no commu human communication course you take when you're five years old that we know how to talk to each other. It's not only that, the first 20 years of our life, we're told to sit there and shut up. You know, and then if you ever do say something, you're laughed at by your, your siblings or your peers in school. And we have this huge issue with communicating. Everybody needs to learn how to communicate. This is, there's no scarcity in people that need Toastmaster skills, none. All we have to do is be willing to ask people if they're interested, invite them to the meeting, you know, and, and I'll tell you my story. You know, I joined Toastmasters. I had a friend of mine invite me to the club eight times, okay? Eight times. Every week I'd see him and he goes, and he didn't say, gosh, Lance, you're, you're really doing horrible in life. You know, you, you, you run on and on. You never know how to stop. You have bad transitions between your stories. He didn't tell me that. <clears throat> he said, we had so much fun. Oh, you should have been there. We had so much fun. Remember that number one thing people are looking for is to have a fun time. And so what if he'd only asked me seven times? I wouldn't be here today. I wouldn't be a world champion speaker. I wouldn't be one of the key people in my club, that one of the top, top, top 10 clubs in Toastmasters. My life would have been the same. <laughs> it wouldn't have changed because of Toastmasters. So even if you ask somebody once or twice, just keep being a pest and ask them and you'll have people come to the club. You have to have them to come in there. So those are the three things you don't want to do. Don't own, you don't, you don't want to not own the club, get people to own the club, get them to do the program, and then promote the club on a regular basis. On my website, which I'll put in the chat here, it's lancemillerspeaks.com, by the way, I have like speaking tips cards, I have speech evaluation tips cards, and I have how to build a championship club tips card. I also have audio lessons on how to promote and market a club, on how to build a championship club. And actually, District 42, I just saw Bev LeBlanc last week. She took my How to Build a Championship Club CD, and you may have heard it, and took the questions out and asked them and then had me answer them. She says it's a great training program that they have now, which is great. But the whole purpose of that was to share the things that we found worked in the club. Now, here's another component to Toastmasters, internship for success. There's no manual for living life. And a big component of living life is learning how to figure things out for yourself and not looking around and waiting for someone to come along and tell you what to do. As a matter of fact, from a leadership standpoint, if you're a leader of an organization and you're waiting for someone to come tell you what to do, you're really not the leader of the organization. The guy who comes tells you what to do is the leader of the organization. So if you're going to lead your Toastmasters club, you got to take it and figure out what it's going to, what's going to make it work. Now, just like I was talking about communication, a lot of us had a mindset, and it was less with me than a lot of people, but I still had it. For the first, I said, 22, 25 years of my life, I was being told by authorities, starting with my parents, then my teachers, then my bosses. I always had a higher authority around me telling me I needed to do this. Here's the right way to do it. You know, here's how we here's how we do things around here. So I was always learning the right way to do things. And very few times did anybody say, well, why don't you figure out the best way you think you should do it? That didn't come up a lot. Now, I fortunately, I grew up in a really rural environment and I was doing a lot of things like sailing and canoeing and flying and camping. And I had to figure a lot of stuff out. So I was used to doing that. But in Toastmasters, I see a lot of people feel that they're struggling, but all the other Toastmasters clubs aren't struggling and they just haven't figured out, they're trying to read the manual and there's a lot of good information in the manual. They're trying to figure out how to make it work as though there is this utopic Toastmasters world where everything works when you read the manual properly. 
one of the biggest things I got out of my Toastmasters experience was the confidence in dealing with people and groups and organizations that I could figure mm -hmm. out how to make the group how to make the group work, because it's not all in the Toastmasters manual. We're dealing with human beings, and every human being is an emotional entity. They were not computers. If we were computers, we would just say world peace and everybody would get along, okay? And we don't have world peace because we're emotional entities. And so when you're dealing with people, you gotta to learn to deal with the different personalities and you have different issues that come up in your club. And nothing, Toastmasters gives us the basic tools to work with, but it's us to, up to us to pick up those tools to swing the hammer and build our club. And what I would compare your club to, if I was going to compare it to anything, I'm in the U.S., so I would compare it to like a NFL football team. I, in, in Canada, I would compare it to an NHL hockey team. <clears throat> but if you had a hockey team and you go, I can't get the players to do what they want to do, and they don't score the points, they don't show up for practice on time. If you're the coach of that hockey team, by golly, you'd start making sure that the people showed up on, up on time and you, you'd build that team concept of we're trying to achieve something, we want to win our games, this is what it takes to have a great team. You wouldn't be calling the NA, NHL saying, you know, I can't figure out how to run my hockey team. Can you give me a training or can you get me some better players in here? You know, you should advertise on TV so I can get better hockey, hockey players. <laughs> and there's Toastmasters that go, Toastmasters should advertise more. We can't get them in our club. All that tells me is you don't know how to run a club. It's up to you to build your club. It's your franchise and it's your opportunity to be successful. And, you know, you look at a club and I've looked at so many, I've been to, I said, I've been to 80 districts around the world. I've worked with tons and tons of clubs and the success of the club is a direct reflection of the cumulative leadership in that club, nothing else. Nothing else. I've been to phenomenal clubs and they have great leadership. They have high standards. Another point, high standards build great clubs, low standards build weak clubs. You don't build a better club by letting in worse people. <laughs> I've seen people, you know, they sort of just checked, are they warm and have a pulse? We'll take them, you know, get the credit card out of their pocket because I'm not sure they can reach it. You know, so uh, that doesn't build good clubs. High standards build a good club. You have to have a club that people want to come to. They want, they when guests come to the club, they go, wow, this is something I'd like to belong to. And that's what we created with my club. It was such a dynamic club. And I'm also going to share this. I got district leadership on here. God bless you. Okay. Um, a lot of my district leadership was trying to split my club. And people asked me, they said, when you had like 80, 90 members, didn't they want to split your club? I said, well, one person mentioned it and I broke their nose and nobody asked me that after that, you know, <laughs> but here's what I said. I go, look, people don't want to join a Toastmasters club. They want to join our Toastmasters club. There's plenty of Namby Pamby Toastmasters clubs down the street they can join. Just because you can't start a new club, don't come in and try to break up mine. If they would have broken up the club, it would have killed. We had two weak clubs. We had a really strong club. Now, one of the things I will say, anybody out there that's got a really strong club, there's something I learned in Singapore. There's a club in Singapore, which is Singapore Toastmasters. They have about 120 members in their club. But what they do every year, they spin off a new club. They take 20 of their members and they go start a new club. They still, they're still members of Singapore Toastmasters, but they also start another Toastmasters club. I think Singapore Toastmasters has started like 15 or 18 clubs in Singapore. And that helps the district and it gives you a good solid club to start because you have 20 people that know how to run a Toastmasters club. I've started Toastmasters where nobody knew how to run a Toastmasters club and it's like trying to put cats in a bag, you know? The general evaluator stands up and evaluates everybody's speeches, you know, and it's crazy things go on. I go, what are you doing? <laughs> Did you read what I gave you? So um, the, I, the, the point of this is figuring things out for yourself and not sitting there thinking, I don't know what to do. Therefore, I'm not able. I don't know what to do. Let me figure out what to do. And that's when our club started to move forward. We did a lot of things that failed. And if we, I mean, trust me, I didn't do it by myself. If you did what I was, just what I was going to say, we would have never been a top 10 club with 95 members. It took a really a group activity and trying different things and putting our heads together and stuff. And so again, I would encourage you as, as area directors to get with your clubs and get them to 
figure out what they want to accomplish and to start figuring it out for themselves and trying things, seeing what works, seeing what didn't work. Okay, and uh, we're going to spin this around to some just some leadership basics. The thing I loved about that old DCP program is that we got rewarded for everything we did. We got rewarded for every CC, for every AC, for every new member, for every newsletter we sent out, for every speech craft we did, right down the line. So we set up that year to get as many points as we did. And that Distinguished Club program is what built the club. And one of the key things that built our club was we had a goal as a club. We wanted to be a top 10 club. And like I said, the first year we were like 6,000. The second year, because we filled the forms out, <laughs> We were like 148. It was, it was crazy. We filled the forms out and set them in. We're like 148. The next year, I think, which was the year before me, we were 56. My year, we were 28. And then in 1998, um, 97, 98, we were going for broke and we came in at number 14. And we were like, oh, we missed it by four. So the next year, man, we just doubled down on everything. And that's when we pushed ourselves up to number four. But the point was we had a goal. Now there's something with leadership. As I said, leadership is knowing where you're going and that is having a goal or destination you wanna to go to. And a lot of clubs just sort of meet every week and they don't necessarily have a specific goal. We have a goal to first of all be presence distinguished but we also have a goal to get every member through a speaking level every year. Uh, we usually, how many new members do we wanna have at the end of the year? We have a yearly goal. But one of the things I would recommend if you're a an area director and you're trying to turn clubs around is set an attainable goal. And this is a whole leadership concept that I have is you give your groups attainable goals, not necessarily the end goal you want to hit. What's an attainable goal? Okay. The attainable goal is let's start the meeting on time and you just get them starting the meeting on time. Good. Now they take a win on they starting the meeting on time. Good. Now let's have three speakers at every meeting. Okay, well, we've only had one the last 15 meetings. I know, let's get three speakers every meeting. So good, now you're starting the meeting on time and now we're getting three speakers every meeting. You're just baby stepping them. If you ever saw the movie, What About Bob, which I love, baby steps. You're baby stepping them towards attaining what they want. You're not saying you need to start the meeting on time. You need three speakers, you need eight new members. You need you know five level fives. You don't hit them with that all at once. Just get them to do one thing at a time. And again, just an outside Toastmaster story on attainable goals. A friend of mine in the National Speakers Association, <clears throat> as, uh, his name is Mark Eaton. And Mark is a professional, was a professional basketball player. And I think he was recruited by the Utah Jazz. And at that time, the Utah Jazz had lost like, I don't know what it was, 40 games or 50 games. And they lost them by like eight, 10 points. They were just getting annihilated. And he came on the team and they had a new coach and the coach, here was the attainable goal. The goal, the coach said, let's see if we can lose a game by six points. <laughs> and so their goal was to lose the game by six points. And so they finally started losing the games by six points. And he goes, good, let's see if we can lose the game by four points. And he said, they lost the game by four points. And after that, they went, this is ridiculous. Let's win a game because I don't want to lose a game by four points, but he, he didn't go, we got to win games. No, let's lose the game by six points. Okay. And so let's just make an attainable goal that you can that you can have. And again, that's one of the things that I worked with with a lot of the people in my club was just an attainable goal. They were scared to death to give a speech. You know, OK, well, attainable goal was why don't you let's pick a topic that you can talk about. And that was that. That's all I did with them for that week. They picked a topic and the next week. Well, let's look at how you can put that speech together. You know, and so attainable goals are something that's a really good leadership tool you can use to help people um attain what they need to because it gets them to take a step that they know they can take and then they, then you give them a win you validate them for attaining that little step there okay and again i use this in business all the time and i learned this in toastmasters and that's why again i'm just going to come back i talk about this experience in toastmasters as such a great internship for us to figure out our leadership styles our people skills and, um, and stuff. So we can figure them out in an environment where it's okay to screw up. It's okay to make a mistake. Nobody's gonna fire you in Toastmasters, okay? Now, I wanna go through the team structure with you just a little bit. I'm gonna share the screen and walk through the different officer positions. 
on how to set that up to get to get the club to work properly. And this is something I developed for my club when I was president. I was coming in as president. And uh, OK, I don't have screen share. There we go. I just got it. Screen share. OK, so the team structure. So let's look at the officer positions. Now, there's there's another management component, leadership component, is you can't manage something you can't measure. And here's what happens if you don't have something to measure, an objective measurement of it, you manage by opinion. And we've all experienced that. And opinions are like armpits. Everybody's got a couple, but nobody wants to experience the other person's, okay? So, so the point is, when I started to set up my Toastmasters club, and I have a lot of organizational design background I brought to Toastmasters. So I looked at every officer position and I said, how can I measure that person so they know if they're doing a good job and I know if they're doing a good job. And it's not my opinion and their opinion, because we're going to argue all the time if we have opinions. So the first officer position, if, if, I'm, if I do these live, I said, who's responsible for setting up the meeting space? And everybody has to tell me what the officer is. And we know that's the sergeant at arms. So we put the sergeant at arms here. Now I had to figure out how to measure if the sergeant at arms was doing a good job or not. Okay, so what I came up with was a functioning meeting space and an on-time start. That's how I determined if they were doing a good job. So the meeting space had to function properly, which meant the air conditioning had to be on, we had enough chairs, the lectern's in place, the gavel's there, the ribbons are there, the banners are up. You know, we have, we have video cameras and microphones in my club, all that had to be put together. You know, everything had to be functioning. And then the, it's up to the char, sergeant at arms to get everybody in their seat and start the meeting on time. And then I have a graph. And every time the meeting starts on time, I mark it that we had an on-time start. And if there's anything that goes wrong in the meeting where the microphones don't work or we don't have the ribbons or whatever's going on, we just talk about it and make sure we get that corrected and they know that they have to have a functioning meeting space. Okay, now my next question is, which officer is responsible for getting guests to arrive at the club? Most districts I talk to, everybody goes to the vice president of membership. And that's not completely wrong because that's what Toastmasters teaches. But what does the, when I looked at this, I said, the vice president of membership is responsible for members. The vice president of public relations is responsible for the relationship with the public. And that the reason we have a relationship with the public is to let them know we're here and to bring in guests. So what we did is we took our vice president of public relations and we made the number of guests their measurable um, statistic or their product that they want. Their vice president of public relations is responsible for getting guests to come to the meeting. Okay, And that's why they run all the programs that, that they're supposed to run, newsletters and things. But I met with Dan Rex and Sally Newhall Cohen and went through all this with them. And Sally actually originated just so you know, those are two of the top people in Toastmasters, if you don't know who those people were. And Sally originated, she said, you know, the VPPR is really a wrong title. It should be the Vice President of Promotion and Marketing. And if you think of your Vice President of PR as you're promoting and marketing the club, it makes a lot more sense. And I'm, I'm reaching out trying to get, what, what is a Vice President of Promotion and Marketing doing in a business? They send promo out to get people to reach for the service so the salespeople have someone to sell the product to. Okay, so the vice president of public relations drives guests into the meeting. The guests go to the meeting and they go, wow, this was the most incredible experience I've ever had in my life. And then they see the vice president of membership. Okay, that's the next person on the team. And the way we, the vice president of membership, we measure their productivity is the number of new members we get. So how many people do, you, do we have? And we have a graph that we measure how many new members are we getting? And the vice president of membership sees what their score is and as an executive committee or president, I see what their score is and nobody's complaining that that's an opinion. I see how many new members we have. So it's up to the vice president of PR to get enough guests in that the VP of membership can have enough new members. Then once the VP of membership gets the person in to fill out the membership form and they go to the treasurer and they pay their dues and the treasurer is accurate financials and dues collected. So I'm, I make sure that they can add and subtract you know, they had to go at least through fifth grade to be uh, a treasurer and they can add and subtract. And then every September and March, we work with the treasurer to make sure that everybody gets their dues collected. And then we move on to the hardest job in the club, which is vice president of, of education. And that is the number of education completions. 
So the whole purpose of the VPE is, is to get the number of members through their education completions. Now, right now in your clubs, <clears throat> every member should be slated for what they will have done, have completed by June 30th. That should be known right now. You should have their agreement on what level in pathways they are going to have completed by June 30th. And then the VPE is just scheduling them out. You should not have anybody sitting there going, I don't know, what am I gonna do in my next speech? That's bad management, okay? That's not owning the club. When you own the club, you're in the club, you're doing the program, good. You're gonna get five more speeches done between now and June 30th. I'm gonna schedule out to do that. So again, as area directors, go back to your clubs and get them to schedule everybody out. And now they're running a program instead of trying to figure it out each month. Now, the last one here is the secretary and they just basically keep accurate records of the club. And what happens is, as somebody comes in over here at vice president of PR, they go through the program, they experience Toastmasters, they get the twinkle in the eye, the spring in their step, they get confidence, they get competence and they go get their friends and they bring their friends in. And that's what built my club. People were winning in the club and they were bringing their friends in, dragging them in by the head of the hair sometimes saying, sit there and watch this club. <laughs> now, the last person is the president. Let's look at them. The president uh, does two things. One is they help the officers win at their job. There's two reasons a president makes sure the officer is going to win at their job. The first reason is that the club member should have a positive, successful experience as a club officer. The second reason is if the officer doesn't do the job, the president gets it. And if you wanna have a horrible time as a president and have a bunch of officers that aren't doing their job and you're having to do the treasury, you're having to set up the room, you're having to go out and promote people, or you're having to schedule everybody because your officers aren't doing your job, make sure your officers do the job. The other thing is you're gonna, you're gonna have a problem as president because the hallmark of Toastmasters is as soon as you become competent at a job, we replace you with someone who's not competent. Okay. <laughs> so, you know, when you're president, you have to get help. And there's two places you get help. If you're having problems that the meetings aren't starting on time, people aren't showing up, we don't have new members, all the different things you can have, sit down with your EC or your club and say, we got a problem, let's solve this. But don't let that problem fester. But tap the membership of your club to solve the problem. If you can't solve it, go outside the club, tap some of the district leadership to come in and help you. What should we do? We, we just can't seem to get new members in our club. Sit down with some people, but, but as a leader, don't sit there and let it fester. Solve the problem, figure it out. Okay, and, and to me, the product of a Toastmaster is winning members and an expanding club. Now, winning members is people doing the program and it's the twinkle in the eye, the spring in the step. Okay, it's people enthusiastic about their program that they're winning with Toastmasters. And the expanding club is when you leave the club, you have more members and more educational achievement than you did the year before. More members, more educational achievement. If we really look at the simplicity of what Toastmasters is, there's two components. It's members in and members educated. That's all we're doing. Members in, members educated. Members in, members through the program. And that's really the simplicity of the program. Now, it gets a lot more complicated than that because, uh, as I said, we all come into it. We have our own incompetencies we're dealing with. We're getting to discover our own self-imposed limits on us that we put on why we feel we can't be successful. And we're put in an environment where we, a fun, friendly environment where we can succeed in life. And then we get to discover what do I have between my ears up here that's not allowing me to actually achieve what I need to in life, identify that, blow it out, gain the confidence to move forward and be a success in life. And again, I'm just gonna come back around to that. This, to me, we can sell this so well as an internship for success in life because remember those four areas of development, speaking, feedback and coaching, which is probably one of the most critical things we can do in life. You can look at anybody in your life who's helped you become more competent. That is a highly esteemed individual. And that's what we learned to do in Toastmasters, effective meeting management and effective leadership. Everybody needs these skills. There's no reason that every club doesn't have, quite honestly, to me, a Toastmasters club is 40 to 60 members. It's not 20 members. It's 40 to 60 members. Um, I think everybody achieving, everybody achieving their educational goals every year, a fun, friendly environment that's highly productive. That's really what we have here. But with this, we can change the world one life at a time. 
Remember, we're reviving the dead. Back over to you, uh, Russ. All right, thank you so much, Lance. Uh, everybody put your cameras on, please. I wanna show them some District 42 love. Woo! Uh, thank you, guys. <laughs> Yeah, Lance, that was amazing. You know, I've heard I've heard some of your material before, but it it never gets old. It, it you you make it fresh every time you present it. Uh, I got so many nuggets out of there, and I tell you, I, I was following the chat room, and there was just message after message coming up there uh, about what you were saying. People agreeing, saying they needed to get get this done. Um, people asking if you could share your slide deck because uh, it was such a great visual. I actually took a, a picture of it, so I'll bring that back up later. You know, you, you had some real nuggets today. I'm not going to share all of them, but some that I really found good. First, I got to say, yeah, you did stay at my home twice. I didn't want to say twice because I thought people might say, hey, why didn't you stay at my place? <laughs> so, <laughs> um, some of, some of your nuggets today, uh, we, we need to inspire our teams, right? We've got to keep them, keep, keep them going. Make it fun for, for, for your teams. Make it fun for your club members. Get everybody to get with the program. Uh, I loved your Weight Watchers analogy. I think that's one we could all use or come up with our own. Uh, but that hit, that really hit home for me. It's like trying to put cats in a bag. Yeah, that's brilliant. Some of your analogies and, and your wording is great. So uh, again, on behalf of everyone in District 42, thank you so much for being with us today, Lance. I wish we had more time for you because we could, we could probably listen to you for a few more hours. But, well, uh, thank, you, thank you, Russ. I felt like I was doing a pretty heavy, fast download on you, but I hope I was trying to get, I was trying to convey as much information as I could in the time that I had. Um, you know, keep in mind, I was just talking to you guys last week. So District 42 is getting a lot, <laughs> a lot of my time, but that's fun. You know what? Well, again, I'll just say one of the one of the real beauties that I've enjoyed in my life is to have what I consider great friends all around the world. And I look on the call right here, you know, with it. I, of course, Russ and I have a long history. I see Chuck sitting here and uh, Bev and uh, all the different people that I've met at District 42 over the years. It's literally like uh, I, I come up to Calgary or something like that. And it's like, gosh, I hope I have time to see everybody. You know, so it's a very, very special place in my heart and uh, and on my head, of course. So uh, <laughs> I, I think so I'll, I'll get up there for the stampede one time. Hopefully I won't have to wear a mask the next time I come up. So, <laughs> <laughs> but thanks so much. And uh, it's really easy, quite honestly, with uh, with, of course, with the virtual stuff. I don't have to miss my flights. If anybody knows about my flights to District 42, I think of any district I've come to, I've had more problems getting to your district than than I've ever had. So uh, anyway, canceled flights, broken airplanes, weather, weather issues. It's just been crazy. So. <laughs> All right. Thanks again, uh, Lance. And we'll look forward to seeing you the next time as well. doesn't Absolutely. matter how many times you speak here. You always have uh, a lot of great things to say and you add so much value. Thank you, my friend. We'll uh, see you guys see you soon.